When Christina Long got the chance to receive her COVID-19 vaccination, she tried to energize others to join her. I will say I was a little bit ornery though. A communication professional who owns CML Collective in Wichita, Long has worked with Sedgwick County and the Kansas Leadership Center to connect diverse communities with facts about the pandemic. One of her current challenges is tackling information and access gaps when it comes to getting the vaccine. But even she has faced challenges communicating about the vaccine with people she knows. There is a vaccine clinic that one of my um, partner companies who I work with that they offered and so they were gonna make it open to people who I work with. And so I went ahead and I signed up for it and I encouraged others very close to me. They made the process easy. So let's come on, let's get vaccinated. And even in some of my personal circles, uh, there is that hesitancy. I, I will share one response. They're like, oh, Christina, thank you so much for letting me know, but I'll just wait to see if you live or die first. It turned out to be more than just a joke. It was serious because that person yeah. did not come to the clinic. But Christina didn't give up. Instead, she used a little bit of honoriness and humor to continue the conversation. I sent a picture that someone took of me mid blink <laughs> when I got my shot, so like my eyes were half open. And I said that, I said, well, what do you think? <laughs> they were like, this is not helping me. <laughs> but anyway, um, again, and that just shows you can have a little bit of fun. We've gotta be able to find, again, some silver linings and all of this um, sadness that has wrapped through our country. Um, as it relates to COVID. And so if you can, again, make somebody smile with a mid blink shot <laughs> in order to, yes, I acknowledge what you said, but I'm still here and you still should consider it. Christina's story illustrates dynamics that communication researchers such as Dr. Brett Bricker of the University of Kansas are beginning to more fully understand. Stories tend to trump facts and people want to hear about the experiences of family and friends. I started writing about vaccines well before the COVID vaccine. And the, the issue that I was primarily focused on with a colleague of mine, Jacob Justice, was focused on public understanding of the MMR vaccine. Um, so mumps, uh, measles, rubella, and its ties to anti-vaccination campaigns that largely tied it to autism. Mm. And what we found was that the science was similarly overwhelmingly clear. The, the CDC had done longitudinal studies on millions of children that had received this vaccine and showed no correlation between the likelihood of getting a vaccine and autism. So what we started to study was the patterns of behaviors in the people that were skeptical of the vaccine or downright anti-vaxxers. And what we labeled this phenomenon as was is the postmodern medical paradigm, which is basically the idea that people no longer believe that their doctor um, has more useful information to them than their Facebook friend. And they people no longer think that uh, a study done of a million people is more believable than a story that they hear on Twitter from their friend. And the whole concept of expertise, in particular in the medical community, has been flattened, where what, like, what it means to be an expert in an area is not necessarily something that the public really comprehends or that large segments of the population really care to really ascertain. In the social media age, many people like to make their decision based on their own research. And in a world awash in information, it's not hard to confirm your own intuition. If you search hard enough, you can find someone that agrees with you. And that's actually a very um, validating feeling to think my intuition, what I understood about this thing is correct. And um, that goes back very much to this postmodern medical paradigm where, um, yes, people want to be empowered to make their own decisions and they want to feel as if they can, can shape their own path in whatever it is they seek to do. And in this case, that runs directly counter to some of the things that we need to reach herd immunity in our state. Recent polling suggests large majorities of Americans are willing to get one of the COVID vaccines or have already received it. But certain Americans are more skeptical than others. For the vaccines to be most effective at ending the pandemic, large numbers of Americans, as many as 85% by some estimates, must choose to get the shots. And it has to be their choice, Bricker says, because mandates tend to harden skeptics' opposition. My hypothesis is that there is something very um, 
central to the uh, American identity, and in particular the conservative American identity, that one should be able to have free reign over their choices, that, that their liberty is paramount, and we can you know, trace this back to you know, our founding fathers and the Constitution, and that is something that's deeply ingrained in people. And it's almost like people are um, willing to um, you know, if they know that it's themselves making a somewhat risky decision or they rationalize it as a somewhat risky decision, that might be a more acceptable practice for them than having that risky decision forced on them by the government. That means persuading rather than coercing a significant number of Americans to agree to get vaccinated despite their doubts or concerns. But not every group sees the issue the same way. Vaccine hesitancy or vaccine skepticism is a very broad catch-all category that fits some very unique problems. So I think that the types of concerns that are faced in the uh, Latin American and Native and Black communities in Kansas are very different than the concerns that are faced by white evangelicals and conservative men in the state. But they have around the same rate of vaccine hesitancy or you know the, the, the same rate of vaccination. So the messages that will be used to persuade those two populations are very, very different. For instance, Bricker says community centers and churches could play big roles in communities with large populations of people with Latin American heritages, in part because people from those areas can have historically fraught relationships with government. When it comes to the African American community, among others, Long says it's important vaccines are promoted with culturally responsive messaging. That's something that worked for Long and officials in Sedgwick County with COVID prevention. When you're thinking about people being receptive to messages, number one, does it look like the message is geared towards them? So who are you featuring in the messages? I'll be quite honest, if we're looking at targeting African-Americans with messaging, but there is not an African-American that is included in you know, the brand look or included on the imagery, then is that truly a message that is for me? Every little thing matters when it comes to advertising, from color schemes to the language chosen. Are we talking in terms of medical jargon or are we actually synthesizing and translating that information so that anyone who picks up that message can be able to read it and understand it and act upon it? But it's hard to persuade anyone if you aren't really willing to try to understand their concerns. There are understandable reasons why some might be reluctant to get the vaccine. For one thing, vaccines followed an unusually speedy path to distribution and use technologies that might be less familiar to some. Others might fear the side effects from a shot more than they do the virus at this point, despite evidence that vaccines are safe and effective and the virus remains harmful to many. I try to have a conversation pretty much every day with someone about a vaccine. And yesterday, actually, I had a conversation with someone who was vaccine hesitant and their reason was that they um, recently had a friend who got the COVID vaccine and then had to go to the hospital because they were nauseous and suffered from dehydration because of that. And and that the power, I mean, that power of that particular example was far overwhelming any of the examples I could have given to the contrary. And that that goes back to the power of narrative, the power of intimate interpersonal connections that kind of outweighs the importance of these scientific facts. But Bricker has developed an approach he's found effective. First and most importantly, you have to be willing to listen. And that listening might be very frustrating. So for example, if, if you don't believe that there is a Chinese microchip in the vaccine, but someone else does, you still need to listen to why they believe that and the fears that come with them from that. Step two is I never start with a, a, a declarative sentence. I always ask questions and don't assume that you know you know all the answers because a lot of these concerns uh, you know they have a kernel of legitimacy to them so kind of when you're asking questions be willing to say i don't know the answer to that exactly and be willing to find a middle ground that doesn't result in you know you're not always going to get to from a to from step a to step z with you know them vaccine card in hand in one conversation um so Step one is listen, step two is ask questions, and then 
Step three is to come to an agreement. And that agreement can very easily be, let's agree to have another conversation about this in two days. And what I've found from that is, is that that does kind of get to the heart of at least some people's concerns. Long acknowledges that it can be difficult to put yourself out there because people have so many different viewpoints on this issue. Being willing to understand that if you do share, especially on social media, you might get some of those negative comments and that's okay. Um, you do not have to go back and forth with people. In conversation, you don't have to go back and forth with people. You can just listen and acknowledge and validate their concerns by saying, I hear what you're saying, I understand, but for me, this is what worked for me and this is why. And let that be. And you never know what you could say that could motivate people to put down the battle gear <laughs> and just listen in order to come to their own understanding or even to help um, clarify their position on where they do stand. Most people just want to be heard and may not fully realize just how common their concerns are and that there's information available to address them. Some people have a concern that they just don't think anybody else has thought about yet. So they think, you know, I've, I've got this problem and, and this is my problem. And once they realize that other people out there have thought about this and other people have had conversations about this, then the, their attachment to that concern begins to lessen. The bottom line, individual leadership of everyday people communicating with those who trust them matters when it comes to promoting the vaccine. Perhaps even more than the choices of those with high levels of authority or notoriety. What we're seeing is some of the hesitancy is starting to be combated just a little bit because more and more people are going to get vaccinated and not just uh, people like celebrities and things like that, but the people who, again, we live, work, worship and, and play um, within our cities and our communities. And Long says leadership on this topic doesn't have to be complicated. To be kind of a, a great champion, um, amongst the people who you know, sometimes it boils down to just being comfortable carrying a conversation with them about your vaccine experience. Um, what, I mean, being basic too, as well. What did you do? How did you go and get an appointment set? Who did you call? Did you go through the internet? What kind of information did you have to have? What did you have to show? What were the lines like? Where did you park? I mean, be, being quite specific about it. Um, and then also, you know, I, I know that social media continues to be a predominant force of information. So being willing to share some of that on social media as well in your networks. The more leadership that happens in the months to come, the more likely it is that Kansans can finally celebrate putting the pandemic behind them.